When we think about grief, we often think about bereavement, but there are many other losses that can profoundly affect us. In this Good Grief panel, we'll be focusing on the losses experienced by children who are adopted or in care. We will think about the specific challenges they face, discuss the role of memory and grief, and suggest ways to open up safe spaces for kids to ask questions, express their feelings, and tell their story. I'm Liesl Dawson from the University of Bristol, and I'm really delighted to introduce our three guests. Malik Al-Nazir is an author, poet, and academic from Liverpool. His memoir, Letters to Gill, gives a compelling account of being taken into care at the age of nine, after his father became paralyzed. After leaving the local authority care system, traumatized, homeless, and destitute, a chance meeting with poet and civil rights activist Gil Scott Heron changed his life. Our second guest is Alison Crowther. She's a coach, speaker, trainer, and the founder and director of Made to Last Resilience. She is also an adoptive mother. Our final guest is John Simmons. He's the director of policy, research, and development at Quorum, formerly the British Association for Adoption and Fostering. He is a qualified social worker with substantial experience in child protection and family placement, and is the adoptive father of two children, now adults. So welcome to our guest. Thank you so much um, for joining us on Good Grief today. I'm gonna to start with Malik. Um, you have a, a, a kind of amazingly terrifying story about being taken into care. I wonder if you could share some of your story with us. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I was taken into care under the um, under the Act of 1969. I was uh, nine years old in 1975, and my mother was a, a young white uh, Welsh woman uh, who had four black kids. And my father became paralyzed after having a stroke and became a quadriplegic. And the social workers thought my mum would be better off if she gave up her four mixed race kids and found herself a nice white man and had a proper family. And that is a quote. Um, so we were being attacked in school. Um, I lived in a neighborhood with 100,000 white families and four black families. Uh, the story of little black Sambo in the jungle was played in school assemblies by the headmaster. 10 Little Nigger Boys was on the national curriculum. Gollywogs were on jam jars, blackjacks in the pick and mix. Um, and we were constantly being racially abused, attacked in school. And when we fought back, um, we had chips on our shoulders and we were you know, considered to be um, troublemakers. So the social services stepped in in 1975 and took me into care. Um, their initial um, induction, if you like, into care was to take me to the Liverpool Children's Admission Unit and lock me in solitary confinement in a room with uh, bars on the windows for 14 days and nights, what they called isolation, um, which was intended to um, sever me from my family and acclimatize me to what would be a life in care. I was then marched into the juvenile court in Liverpool, where I was uh, you know, put in front of a judge and recalled those, those words, those Latin words in loco parentis, without really understanding what they meant. I later came to find that they meant in lieu of the parents. And it was essentially the edict that took away my parents' rights and vested those rights with the state. And I spent the next nine years in and out of uh, a very brutal and abusive um, care regime, moving from children's home to children's home, community home to community home, various different uh, types of assessments and observation centers, um, suffering um, a variety of trauma, uh, various different types of abuse from, from one place to the next. Um, and I document all that in my book, um, Letters to Gil, which I, I vowed when I was 10 years old that one day I would expose this system for what it was and I would um, I would write a book and I would, would tell my truth. But at 18, when social services deposited me in a hostel for homeless black youths in Toxteth in Liverpool, um, I was uh, destitute, I was homeless, I was semi-literate, I received £100 from social services was told to sign a form to say I'd never come back for any more. And I was abandoned. There was no transitional arrangements. There was no follow-on arrangements. There was no 
you know, regard to the fact that I'd, I'd been severed from my family. Uh, my father had died whilst I was in care. I didn't even go to the funeral. I didn't find out he died until after he'd been, you know, cremated and his ashes had been scattered. Um, and, you know, there was no grave to go and visit. I had no opportunity to really grieve for my father. To this day, I haven't grieved for my father. Um, but the grief that I did suffer was was what you would refer to as a living loss. I grieved for the loss of my mother, whom I was very close to, and the loss of my siblings and everything that I knew and, and held on to. It was all gone. The care system removed all of that and replaced it with things which were um, traumatic. And those traumas persisted um, to the point where after I left the care system um, and I found myself in a situation of destitution, I struggled to um, to find my way. And had it not been for one caring adult, um, the, the poet and activist Gil Scott Heron, seeing some potential in me um, and wanting to take me out of the situation in which he found me and give me, um, you know, a kind of a, a reason to live and also um, some direction, I would not be where I am today. And he taught me, you know, to, um, to, to use poetry to become literate. I was able to go on to college and university I'm currently reading for a PhD at Cambridge with a full scholarship, and I'm doing work now around uh, policy development. And um, I've got a bill going through the House of Lords at the moment to widen access and participation for Black people. I'm currently preparing a policy document um, on um, uh, widening participation um, and lifting barriers for Black people within academia. And I've uh, held a number of um, uh, keynotes and, and various different um, uh, seminars at universities up and down the country, including the Brigstow Institute in uh, Bristol with um, social policy makers. I delivered the keynote at the Care Commissioners Conference last year, um, where I'm using my book as an example of just about everything that could possibly go wrong with the care experience that did go wrong and how dysfunctional the care system was. Um, and I wanted that to come out in light of the um, the, the care, the review of child social care that was was happening that year. Um, so policymakers could use my case study, if you like, as an example of what not to do, because every single thing that the state was mandated to do when they, you know, put themselves in local parentis, um, they failed to do. And it took someone from outside of the system who was not in local apprentice, who did not have a duty of care to me, who was not, you know, in any way responsible for me, but just showed that kindness to me um, to really unlock my potential and give me the opportunity to achieve what I'm achieving today. And that demonstrates quite clearly that the problem was never with me. The problem was with the system. Absolutely. It's it's such a horrendous story. And you know, what you went through is is just awful to think about. It, it sounds like prison, you know, it doesn't sound like being taken into care. Care is, is a misuse of the word there. And through this process, you, as you say, you lost your family, you lost your siblings, your community, everything that you knew. And, and during this time, even the death of your father. And I'm, I'm interested to know how, I mean, you've, you've managed to do such an incredible lot of things with your life and I wonder how you dealt with or integrated or felt some of that grief was that something that you you did you block that out as, as a young person as a child did you only experience late it later or how did you handle and and sort of give time to those experiences and those losses I think really to address that in a, in a sort of logical and rational way, one would have to have an understanding of that it was in fact grief that you were dealing with. And in order to do that, you would have to have a degree of insight. Um, I did not have any such insight because I had never been given any such insight because there was no transitional arrangements to come out of the care system. There was no uh, pastoral care arrangements to support you through the process of transitioning through the care system or indeed out of the care system into normal society. So as a consequence of that, there was no mechanism for me to identify that what was internalized within me was in fact grief. Um, so this uh, concept of, of, of you know, recognizing that you are in a grieving process, that you have suffered both living and, you know, death losses in, in your existence um, really came much later in life. And I think the internalization of those things, which I later came to understand as grief, 
was um, you know, manifest in behaviors which in some cases were quite extreme. Um, you know, there was a tendency towards, you know, um, uh, just taking everything out of proportion. Um, so, you know, the smallest little thing would potentially for me have the gravest of consequences. So I lived in a state of perpetual fear that at any moment I could be snatched away and taken back into these institutions and kept there forever and have no rights and be treated, you know, in, in the most, um, you know, uh, traumatic of ways. So, so I constantly lived under that kind of sword of Damocles hanging over my head, which affected every aspect of my existence. And that fear factor that is there, that is, is constantly with you, precludes you from being able to become introspective and to sit down and try to think about the things that might help you to overcome whatever it is that you're going through because you are just subject to them and reacting to them. That behavior can also manifest in terms of aggression. That behavior can sort of um, direct you towards a life where you're kind of feral um, because there's no one over you anymore. And suddenly, you know, the spring kind of recoils. You've come out of the care system and, you know, you're on the streets and now there's no one telling you what to do and the streets are wide open and the streets beckon and, yeah. and you're kind of ripe for the plucking because you don't understand the streets. You didn't grow up on the streets. So if I no, had absolutely. That, question, that would have yeah. been a, would have been a problem for me. I think what you say is so powerful and so important. And actually one of the key things about any grief or loss that we've talked about is that it needs to be acknowledged, you know, and children in particular need to be given a vocabulary and an understanding of what they've experienced. And if you don't have that vocabulary or that acknowledgement, then it makes perfect sense that you misinterpret some of the emotions and, and you know, you take them out in other ways. And, and, and what we know about grief is that it's often not the experience of grief, the feelings of grief that are really damaging, but the ways in which we try to block them or avoid them through other kinds of behavior that can be really damaging. And um, you also don't make that causal link. And you don't see it, the, yeah, between, absolutely. Between the, the source of it, that you are in a grieving process. Absolutely. And behavior that manifests as a consequence of it. And I think your, I mean, your story is so, so extreme that I think no one now would, could question the fact that, you know, grief and loss is something you've experienced. But I think we also know that children who, you know, are, are in a much happier situation, and John, I'm going to turn to you here, you know, kids who are adopted sort of happily and have happy homes to go into, they also might experience forms of loss as well. And, and maybe sometimes those forms of loss aren't always as seen or acknowledged. And John, um, I wanna hear about your situation too, but just to pick this point up, what are some of the kinds of loss that children in care and adopt children, you know, adopted children have? I think one of the things that stood out, um, li listen, listening to um, your really traumatic story, Malik, is that, um, you know, over the years, my sense was that the the care system was more was better at breaking relationships rather than making relationships and one of the things that um really kind of stood out for me given the crises in your family and the trauma in your family um was that i mean it it did bring your family to a kind of sense where relationships were becoming very difficult to sustain you know through through your through your father's health and uh, the situation that your mother actually faced, um, but when when the system actually stepped in, it it seemed it seemed absolutely determined not, not to recognise that uh, you needed they needed to make new relationships for you or to sustain relationships with you. But actually, they broke those relationships that already existed. And you know, and your views about um, those relationships, you know, what you felt about your siblings, what you felt about your mum, I imagine a whole range of other people too, were just not kind of acknowledged for what needed to be built into the future. It was as though that counted for nothing. And, um, you know, you know, and, and that, that uh, the, um, you know, what was arranged for you was really the quite the opposite of kind of recognising that um, you were in a stage of profound grief, and um, you needed to be able to relate to people and to feel a part of relationships with people um, that actually um, uh, could bear to listen to what you have to say and actually acknowledge the huge significance for you, you know, on the way that you actually felt about yourself. And I 
suppose that's one of the things that um, I mean, adoption is 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 complicated in 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 many senses because the ages at which children are removed from their birth parents, um, the ages, uh, how long they have to wait for an adoptive placement to uh, be found, you know, it might may be a relatively short period of time, it can sometimes be years. And, um, and there's still that kind of fundamental issue that, you know, the child, the child is removed from their birth parents, they would typically go into foster care, they would, there would be some sense of trying to build a relationship with their, with their foster, with their foster carers. Um, but at the back of all of that, there's still this kind of fundamental plan for the child that that relationship will be broken too. Um, and the child will move into their adoptive family and have to rebuild another relationship. One of the fundamental things about that is that the, um, um, the adopters are going to have to be very sensitive and aware um, about the, um, uh, th th those relationships that ha have come to an end, that have been broken, and what impact that they actually have on the child in turning to start all over again and make a new relationship or a new set of relationships. So it, it's kind of making relationships in the context of the grief about relationships, whether with birth parents, foster carers, or with brothers and sisters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think it, it's one of the uh, enormously significant issues for prospective adopters and adopters um, to be able to um, be sensitive about, you know, how this affects the child's feelings about themselves, how it affects their behavior when it comes to having a cuddle and putting them to bed, uh, when it comes to feeding them, uh, in routine ways throughout the day, um, when it comes to sitting down in the evening on the sofa and reading a book together, it, they can all be issues that uh, stir up for the child. You know, you're trying to get closer to me, um, but are you just going to kind of walk off and leave me? You know, at the end of this particular event. <laughs> um, so, so it's uh, you know, al al although kind of in some ways, kind of adoption is um, you know, it's a way of trying to resolve some of those problems. Indeed, it is a way of trying to resolve those problems. Um, I, I don't think that um, you know any anybody involved in the adoption sector could ignore the kind of profound consequences of loss and grief for every child that comes to be adopted. Not saying that every child will experience it in the same way. You know, they may well not. Um, but you you um, you can't go into um, adoption and not recognise that grief and loss um, are likely to be a very significant. What, part of what the child's had to learn about themselves and had to learn about other relationships when people come forward to try to establish those relationships. No, that, that, that's really wonderfully put. And it makes sense then that one would have a fear of abandonment or in your case, Malak, like a fear that, you know, something terrible is going to happen or you'll be taken into care or also even a self-protective resistance to forming bonds because you don't want to be hurt again. So these are all really logical consequences of having lived through those experiences. Yeah. And in some ways, if you give kids some of the language and tools in an age appropriate way, then they can start thinking about what's happened to them yeah. and finding ways of telling their story and not just sort of reacting to it. Um, yeah. John, I also, sorry, you might want to jump yeah, in, but I also I, I, want you at some point to, to say a little bit about you as an adopter yeah. and your experiences, but if you want to pick up on any of that, do feel free. No, let, well, so let, let me continue with that. So, so my wife and I um, struggled over quite some years to have um, uh, children of her own. Um, that was traumatic in itself. Um, you know, the, the kind of me medical um, interventions that were then available were very crude. They were very iffy as to whether they could actually result in anything. And after, after a, a few years of um, going through all of that, we decided that we couldn't do it anymore. It had just become too traumatic for us. And, that, you know, and actually there were also issues for, for us when it came to loss and grief. You know, just recognising that something which is, you know, very common for most couples actually be had become elusive, elusive and uh, not possible for us. And of course, the issue was that, um, you know, there was a kind of risk of blaming the other uh, for all of that, which actually I don't, we didn't, we didn't really do. But there, it was, a, there was that kind of sense of, oh, my God, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? And, I, you know, and again, I think that's the kind of part of those issues about grief and loss. Um, how do you explain it? Who do you blame? Do you take responsibility for it yourself? And um, Anyway, we decided uh, that we would go down the route of um, adoption. 
um, we applied to um, our local authority, uh, which was uh, uh, very good, and another local authority. There was an issue with that other local authority in that they said to us, um, if we're going to go down the route of adoption, uh, uh, it will be necessary for you as a white couple to agree uh, to take a black child. And um, that created quite a si significant series of issues for us because I don't, you know, the issue was not about, um, you know, so much that we would now be able to kind of become um, kind of the parents for a black child, but actually we were a white couple and that, that certainly didn't feel right to us. Anyway, so we stayed with the original um, uh, local authority. We went through uh, the approval process. Um, social worker came to visit us at um, um, at home. Um, there were kind of basic uh, concerns that we had because it, we had a very um, um, uh, loving and uh, affectionate uh, Springer Spaniel. And the Springer Spaniel loved to sit on the sofa with the social worker. <laughs> and we were always concerned that uh, the social worker said, oh, you know, if you don't have any control over your dog, how are you going to have any control over your baby? <laughs> Um, but anyway, that worked itself out in the end. So we were finally approved, um, and it was two years later that um, we had a phone call from a social worker at the uh, local maternity unit who said that uh, her baby had been born where the um, mother, who was pretty young, um, was not, you know, was not in a position to actually uh, become the parent for the child. So there were various discussions about um, all of that. We had to think about how to prepare at home, you know, get, getting uh, uh, the cradle ready, getting the milk in, and um, uh, so that we could feed her, getting the nappies, and uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and then the decision was made that uh, we should go and pick her on a, a particular time, a particular date. We went into the hospital, into the maternity unit, and we were just overwhelmed by seeing this little baby girl lying in a pot in the maternity unit. Um, and after, well, we picked her up fairly quickly, but it was um, it was probably about 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes that uh, we left um, and took her home. Uh, so something that had been going on for a very long period of time with a lot of emotion around it um, <clears throat> uh, had suddenly kind of resolved itself, at least, you know, at the beginning of resolving itself uh, when it comes to us both becoming uh, parents for um, our little, well, our daughter, little as she was then, and now um, is a grown-up. Um, then became second issue. We, we were very keen to have a, adopt a second child, and uh, that, that went through a, uh, a similar process. But um, in some ways, it was more complex because his birth mother actually abandoned him in hospital, and that raised quite a lot of questions about, um, you know, would she actually come back and want to um, uh, collect him, or you know, was that a decision that she'd actually made? And in fact. Uh, we haven't heard anything from her subsequently and um, you know we've often uh, been very concerned about what happened to her after she left hospital and uh, you know the trauma of what she would have likely to have experienced um, at that particular time. So, so you know in many ways I would say that um, you know our experience has been a very 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 positive experience. Um, our children were utterly delightful, they got on with the dog very well, um, and we did all the kind of routine, natural things that parents do when it comes to the care of their children. Um, but, I, but I have to say, I don't, I, I, I think that both my wife and I were uh, very aware, th well, have been very aware through the whole of our family life about those kind of early issues about loss and grief. Um, and uh, just recently, my daughter has made contact with her birth mother. They've had They've had contact before, but this was a real... Um, uh, message about trying to reform a relationship uh, between the two of them, which it looks as though they've actually started in a really, really positive way. And, um, and that now looks as though it may include us as well. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And incredible story. Um, Ali, I haven't let you say, say anything yet, and I, I wonder if you want to, to come in, maybe share a bit of your story, and also if there's anything that we've said so far that you want to reflect on. Um, so my story, it's interesting, you've got lots of different kinds of adoption here, um, so John's is right from birth, um, and mine is at the age of 15 months, so my little boy, um, like John it took quite a long time to go through the process and then about two and a half to three years later actually it took me um I was 
offered this um, 15 month old boy. Um, after having said, you know, because you, you get to choose when you adopt, they say, what would you like? And I said, oh, I would love a little bookish girl, I think, you know, <laughs> like that's gonna happen. Um, and so I, I ended up with a rumbunctious boy who ends up has ADHD. So, wow, we are talking energy. It's like living with Cato from uh, the Pink Panther. That's a very old reflection, but um, yeah, he sort of just jumps on things and goes, mommy, and jumps on me. Um, so he's very full of life. He, um, he came to me having probably been, you know, see, it, it's the bit from when the egg is fertilized right up to the birth, as well as the other bit. So he was probably marinated in sort of cortisol and stress hormones because it was a little bit chaotic um, in the mother's life. I mean, obviously, that's why he was taken away. He was taken away as opposed to being relinquished um, and, you know, has what we call triggers. Um, some things in his life, if he sees them, there will be a flight or a, a fright or a, a freeze reaction from he tends to freeze so he'll just go like not like he's not there and, and freeze if he sees those those things that has improved a lot but when he first came to me I noticed that these were some triggers um he uh what to say really what I noticed and what was really interesting for me was when we were doing our training so I work in conflict resolution and I thought wow I tell you what the thing that I'm really interested in is how do you talk to the child about their past because this is a bit I know how important talking is I conflict resolution is all about people not having not had conversations and if those conversations had been had earlier we would not be in this massively hurtful expensive conflict that people are in often with legal and, and all sorts and that stuff breaks your heart um, and this was actually in the environment movement uh, environmental stuff is what I work with so people are utterly passionate frightened about this kind of stuff so I really knew kind of this area and I thought I wonder what they do in adoption this is going to be really interesting I'm going to learn something and every time I asked I just didn't get an answer and even my most favorite social workers would they just it felt like Teflon shoulders. I couldn't, I just couldn't get an answer from it. And so after a few years, I really started asking quite deliberately and saying, how are you doing it to my friends? Because Ollie was becoming um, verbal and, and I thought, right, you know, I really, I need to be doing this, which I kind of had done all the way through. He had books on adoption. And the idea is what they say is talk to them immediately about their past just all the time so that they always know that they've been adopted even though they don't know what the word adoption means of course they don't um, but that word has been there forever and it just feels it's a gentle way in of learning um, and I, I asked around people I said you know what are you doing and and I realized that not many people were doing enough from my work I knew that what they were doing was just not enough and it was you know, oh they don't want to know or they're too young or I'm saving that and I think, oh, oh no, 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 this is this is not good. So I went to the university, the local university, um, and met Debbie Watson there. Somebody had said, hey, you know, some I've seen this thing, Trove, go. And it was the launch of Trove, which you're gonna hear about. Um, and, and I thought, oh, maybe she's done it. This is brilliant. This is it. Maybe, maybe that is what it is. And so I went in and I talked to her. Um, and it was just before Christmas and you know, drinks and everything, and and Ollie came with me. And, and you know, her little girl was there and they had a lovely time hanging out and watching the videos and so on. And, and so I went to see her in the January um, and I, I said, you know, is anybody talking about this stuff? And so she pointed to her desk, to her you know, whole room basically, which was covered in books. And she said, this says that how important it is, all of this stuff. This, and she pointed to a bit on her desk that was about that tall, is what is written for social workers. And this, pointed to a blank desk, is what's available for parents on how to have these conversations. And I thought, oh, right. And she says, yeah, that says it all. Um, and you know, I said, but haven't you, you know, has, has Trove done this? Have you started that conversation with this beautiful box and putting things in it? And she said, yeah, well, sadly, we've started the conversation, but the parents don't know how to do it. So the children are going, right, talk to me. And the parents are going, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. So that's why I got into helping, you know. And so the day after, Debbie called me back and she said, we, 
there's an ESRC grant coming up, let's do something. Let's put your knowledge together with my knowledge and let's do a research project and let's talk about how to have these difficult conversations. So that's what I have been doing. This might be a good moment actually to show the short video on Trove so that people at home can see this tool and understand it. I'm Chloe Meineck. I run my own social design studio. We specialise in co-designing with people and combining physical and digital. Trove is a product we've been designing with and for children in care and adopted children. And the project is a collaboration between my company and the University of Bristol. Trove is an interactive bag that allows the child to be in control of their own life story. It uses digital technologies to bring treasured objects to life through the child's own voice. Inside it's got a visual interface. You can record a story by using the interface and set of headphones and you do that by putting a small little sticker on the object and then putting it on the X to play back the story. The software also keeps an archive of all the different times you've recorded a story about a particular object. Some of the features of Trove include audible instructions to make it more accessible. It's customizable so you can add your own objects and stories. There is a simple visual password to add a level of security to your stories. It can all be backed up to the cloud to keep everything safe. And it's slim so you can fit it under your bed. We have learned that for children who are separated from their families of birth, actually forming an identity depends on what you know about your past, where you came from, your current experiences, and of course your hopes for the future. There was a sense in which talking to Chloe, it seemed that this would fill a real, really important gap because without birth family reminders over time, um, it's very easy for the stories to be lost. The objects remain really, really precious, but the stories get lost over, over time. Objects for all of us are important anchorage points in terms of our identity, in terms of giving us some sense of um, who we are and, and belonging. Trove, I think, is an amazing project. Um, obviously, I've been involved in it since the original prototype quite a few years ago. But I think it's about the importance of life story work, but also the importance of having memories as a child and bringing them into adulthood and how that can affect your identity as you're growing up and the importance of kind of being able to have ownership over those memories through things like the Trove Box. We see Trove being used alongside life story work, but the important difference is the fact that with Trove, the child is in control, so they get to decide what's recorded, what objects are used. And it's not someone telling them what their life story is. So we've seen Trove being used with children as young as four, and we hope that it's something that can grow with them throughout their childhood into teenage years. The project has had a multidisciplinary team behind its creation. Throughout the process of designing Trove, we've been running workshops and pilots with different groups in order to gather feedback. Some of these groups have included care leavers, children in care, adopted children, foster parents, adopted parents and social workers. And all these people have really helped us gather lots of feedback and insights so we know that we're designing something that fulfills people's needs. Some of the benefits we've already seen, especially through our pilot with adopted children, is the fact that they're getting their objects down from the loft and they're asking their parents, oh, where does this come from? What does this mean? And it's really strengthened that family bond and openness to talk about difficult topics. Um, often it's easier uh, to talk about something if you have an object there. And what we've seen is some of the adopters being really happy that they have something to focus on and they can kind of start bonding and chatting about different objects and the child's life story. The next steps for Trove with funding is to test the current prototypes we've got and then it's to iterate on that and get investment to launch this product to get it to the children that need it. By having a Trove, a child knows that they are cared for they can look back on previous experiences, try to connect the dots and have a greater sense of identity and who they are. Ali, just picking up what you said, I think the, the question of having 
conversations and opening up safe spaces for yeah. conversations for children something that didn't happen with you Malik at all um but but you know and I think what you say about having these conversations little and often it not being a hot topic uh very similar with my son who has a disability yeah you know, we we grew up with him growing up we talked about it all the time it's not a bad word it's not shameful it's a part of who he is and and you want it to be a natural, normal part of your day-to-day -day life. So that seems to be one of the, the, the core messages. And objects clearly help as well. Malik, I assume that you went into care without any objects, things from your, I mean, did you, were you able to take things with you from your past? No, nothing at all. Um, what I took with me was the trauma of the event itself. And that went with me throughout. Um, in my book, I described the night I was taken into care in very kind of visceral terms. And um, when I was asked by the Care Commissioners Conference to deliver their keynote, um, I extrapolated a kind of an eight minute segment from my audio book where I narrate um, myself the experience of the social worker coming to collect me, putting me in a car. I describe her car in detail, a green, Hillman imp that had white leather interior because that was the car that would ferry me from one traumatic experience to another. So the degree of trauma that I suffered on that night is captured in that narrative. And I wanted policymakers in particular to hear that because when I came to research my own life in order to bring a legal case for negligence against social services many years later, I had to become the researcher of myself. I had to um, take myself out of myself, if you like, detach myself from the subject matter and operate as a researcher to research my own life. And I was seeing um, budgets for children's homes where it had units of output, children, you know, and I thought I'd been reduced to a unit of output to a line in a budget, you know, and all of these different things that I became aware of um, collectively made me sort of understand how little I meant to the people who were administering me. And that's why I wanted policymakers to understand the first-hand account of what it is the moment you take a child away from a parent, what you're actually doing through the eyes of the child. So I took myself back to my nine-year-old self and I narrated the whole entire thing. And that's what I took with me. The clothes on my back were even taken away from me. I was stripped the first night. I was washed. I was put in pajamas. I was locked in this room. The clothes were taken away. Many of the homes that you went into, they provided you with these clothes, clothes that weren't in fashion, clothes that nobody else would wear, clothes that you'd be ashamed to be seen out in the street with, clothes that distinguished you from the rest of society. You know, we used to have to wear two-tone max with black blazers and, 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 and you know, um, uh, these, these uh, um, trousers, drain pipe trousers. In the 70s, when everyone was wearing flares and Birmingham bags and, you know, and we were marched in twos down the streets to go to a church where we were sat in the back because we couldn't go in the front. And we weren't allowed to take communion with the rest of the people because we were the naughty boys from the naughty boys home. I didn't do nothing naughty. To no, get it. no. And it does, it does seem to me that that process of going back and narrating your life is it almost was you creating your story in retrospect that I you know trying that you managed, to show them. yeah I was trying to yeah. show them that everything that I knew they took away from me even yeah. the clothes on my back were taken away from me I walked into that care system with nothing from my from my life nothing not an object not a toy car nothing that I could hold on to to say this is from my life so when I saw um, this trove that um, Debbie Watson and, 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 and you guys at Bristol have put together, I was fascinated by it. But I, I also thought how wonderful it would have been if I'd have had a thing like that to be able to have some memories in, to be able to at least put something in there to give me a reference point, an anchor to, to, to connect me to, to the life that was being stripped away from me. Because yeah. all that and loving people, long. loving people to care about you and ask those questions in a kind way, in an interested way. And John, John, can I go back to you for a minute? So thinking about kids now who are looked after or who um, are adoptees, what are some of the ways we can open up these conversations from your own experience, both in your work and as a you know, a dad, what what are the best ways of doing this, do you think? 
the mute. <laughs> I think a lot of what Malik said is that, um, you know, our, our experience or objects uh, from the past are a huge important, an important part of who we are. And, you know, why on earth uh, would you want to kind of sever um, a child or a youngster or any or any individual from their past? Um, you know, the, I, I, there may be there may be reasons like, you know, the past was so traumatic. Why would you ever want to go there again? But I, but I, I think that, you know, as human beings, our curiosity about ourselves, um, about the life that we lived before, the people that uh, we lived with before, you know, and there will be all kinds of um, individual experiences or opportunities, you know, that actually mark out that sense of who we are. And I think what Malik said is, is that, um, you know, that, 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 that was, it, it wasn't just that it counted for nothing. It actually was that um, it needed to be taken away from you. And, and it, 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 it then kind of leaves you in a, a kind of an isolated, uh, abandoned state of Kind of mind and, and physical state of mind really and um, so that, that that sense of being curious about who you are and um, asking questions or putting into words or exploring objects or you know it, they, they all become a, a, just a bit of a kind of nightmare really unless there's something which um, is kind of insightful sensitive and supportive which enables a child or young person to actually embark on that that sense of learning about yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we know with um, bereavement that when kids aren't told the truth about what's happening, that they will make something up. Mm. Yeah. So children will sense the emotions. Yeah. And if they're not given a story, they'll find their own story. Yeah. And so you have to, you know, even when things are difficult and painful, mm. children need to be able to integrate those experiences mm. into their life story. And in bereavement, and it seems very similar to me in, you know, kids who've been looked after or kids, you know, who go to, to new homes, mm. there's, there's something Robert Niemeyer calls meaning reconstruction, which is that we take, you know, a, a traumatic event, and then we need to find a way to integrate that into our life story, mm. even as that life story has changed or, you know, in mm. some way. And again, it seems to me that for these children, they need to be given tools mm. to help them understand what's happened to them mm. and somehow bring that into a sense of who they are mm. and, and their life. Mm. Um, Ali, do you want to pick up on any of that? Or Yes. Um, I think it's not only tools, but it's data as well. As much data as they can have, because there's the tools as to how to manage our, our bodies and ourselves so that we don't constantly go into trauma. And what happens is that when you live with a traumatized child, you, you kind of mirror that and also become slightly traumatized as an adult yourself, which we can't afford to do. We need to be their strong place. That's what we need to be. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in what you were talking about, Malik, um, because I've not, I've read not only your book, but also Lem Sisse's book. And Lem Sisse, and he also says this on the documentary that he's done, um, he uses the word, words slippy slidey. Memory is slippy slidey, which is really interesting because it's not a real world it, word, but it's exactly the word that when we did our research, that is also what the children said. They said, my memory is slippy slidey. I was like, wow, you don't, you know, yes, of course, because there is nothing to anchor to. So what our responsibility is as adults is to give them those anchors. And even if you know nothing about the birth parents, it is, for example, like, like John was saying, um, a, a, a girl who has you know, gone, left her child, you, at least you know where that child was born, where that child was, was picked up. And you can go and you know, talk to the nurses and talk about that little bit of love that they had because nurses are incredibly loving and gorgeous on these maternity. So whatever it is that you can do that's a positive, then we do that. And what I do, um, so it's really difficult with lots of adoptive parents. They do not want to go that one generation back with the birth parent, the birth mother, because they, they have a problem thinking about their child being abused in some way by neglect, whatever it is. And some, there are some very dark things that have happened to these children. Um, so not only are we looking after a child who has seen that stuff or heard that stuff, um, but also the, the, 
parent is having a really big tussle inside themselves because they don't know how to talk about it. Yeah, and I so guess for some it, parents too, they might also feel there might be some jealousy there, you know, I don't know, or potentially, feeling, or feeling threatened, and and children who yeah. are interested in birth parents might feel disloyal and think, I don't want to show any interest in birth parents because somehow that might be a rejection of my mum and dad. You find that especially a lot when that you know when you've got sort of a um, a sixty or seventy year old child the child has now reached that age that they have waited for their parents to die and then go and looking because of exactly that disloyalty that isn't quite the same now in that we uh, uh, encourage people to talk about adoption as soon as possible and also to look positively on that past life if you can and pick out things if there wasn't good stuff in the behavior of people then a few generations back where did they come from so my son will say i'm, I'm being my scottish self today and, you know, can I have a kilt? And we go and have a look at kilts and, you know, and, and anything, he had, there are four different cultures that he is, and we can go and have a look at those, try the food, talk about it. And even the, the briefest of conversation, as we're going down the, the, um, the road and there's an Italian restaurant or something, I say, we must check that out. You know, we must go there sometime. And it will be, you know, and he'll think, oh yeah, Italian, that's what I am. And I've, I've, I've barely said anything. I haven't dragged him back into trauma. I haven't done anything like that. I've just mentioned it, you know, really gently and in a really approving, open way going, yeah, all of this stuff that you've been through, I can deal with, with you. And that is our responsibility as the parents. So you don't wait until the children, the child brings it up, say, oh no, that she doesn't seem to have been affected. No, it seems to be fine. She doesn't ask. In fact, when we did the research, a hundred percent of the children said they wanted to know and their parents didn't necessarily know that that was the case not wanted to know about their past so both the data as much as there is and also um you know therefore we, we would need to talk about how you talk about the past which is what difficult com that's difficult conversations is a it's an eight module learning that we give to social workers for them to work through with other social workers, teachers, parents, that kind of thing. And it takes, there are many modules and however the easiest way in is for that parent, you know, is it arts and crafts? Do you sit next to the child and do things and talk? Um, there is lots and lots of ways in history, you know, really going back a long way in time, um, all sorts of things that that child can build that, that central point and we fill it with really useful bits of information, not if we don't talk about it, they will pick out the worst bit and say, that must be me, because nobody talks about my past, so it must be awful. Um, and I'm going to believe everything bad that everybody says about me. And you know, in the, in the training, there's a little one with a, a sort of a void inside it, a little vortex. And then that the child sort of lifts off the floor, not really having any grounding. But if we can fill that, we can fill their, their mind with lots of links to that past, even though we're kind of making them up, they're sort of spurious. Sometimes they're not, they're really, really grounded. So for example, at the moment, I'm writing birth family letters, which we do every six months and we get them back. And my son asks questions and his questions are answered. And I'm very lucky that one side do do the letters. And, you know, and this time I'm gonna send them a big long quote from him saying stuff, um, you know, and this is, you know, it's really, it's possible to have these really good relationships as well, even from a chaotic past. And I suppose one of the, one of the key things uh, for me about all that is, is this fundamental issue about our identity, yeah. you know, our sense of who we are, um, you know, whether that's gender, sexuality, whether it's um, ethnicity, culture, religion, um, you know, there are kind of multiple dimensions that, um, uh, that, that we might use and might value, might struggle with in, in all kinds of different ways. But actually that issue of identity and the child developing an identity where they, where they have a, um, a, a kind of narrative for themselves that actually combines all those issues into something that they feel you know, largely good about, they feel settled with, um, you know, that if it comes up in a conversation, so whether you're having a, a drink in a pub or a, a meal in a restaurant, um, you know, or it's something that happens at school that your kind of sense of 
you know, this is who I feel I am, is a, it's a very, very kind of critical out, out, outcome from, from the kind of whole of that uh, early childhood, middle childhood, um, adolescence particularly, and then into adulthood. Who am I? Who am I? That's really important. Um, we're getting near the end of our time, but I just have a, uh, just a, a couple more questions. Uh, Malik, I'd be interested just to hear, you know, Gil had this amazing impact on your life, was such an important figure, obviously made you feel seen and cared for. And I just wonder if you could say a little bit on that relationship and how it changed the way you saw yourself and your life. Yeah, well, there was a couple of things that I was able to do with Gil Scott Heron that I hadn't, I hadn't really been able to do before. Um, I think going back to what Alison was saying about the importance of being able to have difficult conversations and these various modules that are taught to social workers today. I don't know if in those days there was any such modules um, being taught, um, but I know for a fact that no one was telling my mum how to do that because my mum and I just didn't talk for years about any of this stuff. And it was only when um, Operation Care began and you know various different other operations um, into historic abuse that was happening in these various different institutions that um, we even, you know, were forced to broach the subjects of what went on during my care experience. So as a consequence of, of um, you know, police investigations into the various different abuse allegations that were taking place in these various different children's homes, um, we were forced to have conversations because the police wanted to know stuff. Um, they had hundreds of um, uh, victims of um, child sex abuse, there was um, victims of um, physical abuse, there was a whole range of other um, sort of things that were happening in those institutions that became prevalent and, and conversations needed to be had because people needed detail. And, you know, when you've put something out of your mind for so long and, you know, it, suddenly it takes on new meaning. Um, in my particular case, um, I was, you know, opened up like a Pandora's box by the police when they come knocking on my door. You know, and when they asked me, was I ever sexually abused? And I was like, no, but I had physical abuse. I had pinned down, I had this, I had that. They weren't interested in any of that. They just give me a little, you know, card for the NSPCC and said, go and talk to those guys. And I was just completely traumatized. And I wanted to talk to my mom, have those conversations, couldn't have those conversations. My mom just wasn't ready to deal with any of that. And then I had 10 years of litigation before, you know, so it was before I managed to start to resolve those issues. But during that period, you know, I was able to have those conversations with Gil because Gil had a very, um, you know, he had a deep understanding of global affairs and geopolitics and legal stuff. And, you know, I could give him the whole entire complexities of what was going on with the legal case. And he could just sum it all up. He was a polymath. He, he had 160 IQ. You know, there was nothing he could not compass that I was explaining to him. And I was deep in the detail of, of the case. So that was really the catharsis for me. It was a combination of that and being able to articulate my feelings in poetic terms. And he guided me through the poetry on one track, but he also supported me through what to do about the trauma on another track. And for me, it was about the pursuit of justice. Um, you know, and there was a lot of people who were being sort of put forward because of the um, sexual abuse trauma that they had suffered. Um, but I was being regarded as peripheral to that because I was not sexually abused. And I had to find a way to sort of demonstrate that my cause of action was significant, not to diminish the significance of what had happened to others, but to try and just establish the significance of what had happened to me. And that meant having difficult conversations with my, my mother. So Gil really facilitated that because he enabled me to have an outlet where there was no consequences for me saying it. He did not take me into care. He did not allow them to take me into care. He was not involved during the time I was in care. I met him when I just came out of care. So I could speak to him like a counselor almost. It was completely free. I could say anything to him. He wasn't responsible for any of it. Mm -hmm. So there was no consequences. And I needed that space where I could speak freely to someone who had the mental capacity to be able to understand the complexities of it, the emotional investment in me that they were willing to give me that time, and also um, the skill set to be able to show me how to direct not just my anger or my, my emotional trauma, but also my own talents 
uh, in terms of being able to win my legal case, I won a substantial compensation and a public apology after 10 years of litigation. Um, I published a book of poetry at the end of it, using the money that I got from the from, from winning the case. Um, and I've been sort of working and, and kind of crusading for policy changes um, through my academic work. It's such, such a wonderful end to a very, very traumatic story. And I think it really shows up how important it is for someone just to be able to listen and hold someone's experience without reacting but in a loving compassionate way and how healing that can be and also finding other people who've shared your experience with whom you can you know talk and and also being creative I think creativity as an outlet and a means of channeling and expressing emotions is really really powerful um, we are. Oh, yes, right. I was just going to say yeah. from, to, to Malik, um, you know, people like you are who my little boy looks at as well. Um, you know, he, he came to the lecture that you were doing. I mean, he sat at the back on his iPad, but he was there and he got the book. And we have a little book that says to all in Ali. And and, you know, he's I was reading Lem Sisse's book and he wanted me to read bits of it, of course, not the difficult bits but we would always have a look at his photograph on the back and say he's really happy now and he he's been to see the queen you know this is like great success and um you know in because in children's mind that's kind of important and yeah and and so he knows that these amazing people have come through care they've come through triggers they've come through all of that stuff and they're doing brilliantly and and that seeing somebody like him is yeah. so important so important yeah I think we are now out of time, but this has been such a powerful and moving panel. I appreciate Ali, John and Amalek sharing so much of their lives and themselves. So thank you once again for joining this Good Grief panel and thanks to our audience. Bye for now. <laughs>